Today we'll be talking about the new animated series, Chip and Dale Park Life, and celebrating a very merry anniversary of Disney Animation's Alice in Wonderland. We will also be speaking with director Kate Heron of Marvel Studios' Loki, and so much more. I'm Andre. And I'm Jenny, and this is What's Up Disney Plus, where we talk all things Disney Plus. Everyone's favorite odd duo is back, and we're getting ready with some Chippendale Park Life trivia. Brought to you by Geico. Switch today and see all the ways you can save. Chippendale Park Life follows two tiny troublemakers trying to live the good life in a big city park with some giant-sized sky-high adventures. Disney's beloved chipmunks, nervous warrior Chip, and laid-back dreamer Dale make the perfect odd couple. They're best buddies, and they drive each other nuts. In their perpetual pursuit of acorns, these ultimate underdogs are joined by Pluto, Butch, and other iconic Disney characters as they face down bullies great and small. Now, Andre, you are our resident expert on all things Chippendale. Okay? I know you probably didn't know you had that title, but you do. I didn't know I had that title, but okay. <laughs> so we're gonna test your knowledge with some trivia. Are you ready? Like a chipmunk packs its mouth with acorns, I have packed my brain with Disney knowledge, and it's time to chip away at it. Let's do this. What year was Chippendale first introduced? I had a feeling you were gonna ask me this, so I looked it up. 1943. You are correct, my friend. 1943, though they weren't given names yet. Which of the duo has a gap between their teeth? Hey, that's why I relate to you, Dale. We both got that gap. I feel you, man. Hey, <laughs> Dale. <laughs> Which classic Disney character did they first appear with? Okay, they're usually with either Pluto or Donald Duck. I feel like the first one might have been a little more silent. I'm gonna go with Pluto. Yes! What was the title of the short they first appeared in? Okay, so if they were with Pluto, I feel like it's gotta be like Pluto, it's like Pluto's garden? Private Pluto. Ah! What color were their noses in their first appearance? I think they had the same color nose, like brown, black nose at first and then eventually Dale got the red nose. Is that right? You're absolutely correct, my yeah! friend. They both had black noses. Chip and Dale are named after who? Okay, I know this one. So there was a guy named Thomas Chippendale. He was like a furniture person. And so there used to be Chippendale Furniture. And so they changed Chippendale, his last name, to Chip and Dale. And that's how they got their name. Well, you're right on the money there, my yes! friend. It is Thomas Chippendale, a 1700s furniture designer. How many episodes are in Chippendale Rescue Rangers 1989? Usually an animated series, weekday afternoon animated series, usually has 65 episodes. So I'm gonna go with that. Woo! Yes! Woo! Syndication, baby! True or false, Chip and Dale have appeared on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Oh, hot dog, hot diggity dog, they have. Boop, boop, boo! What color was Dale's hat in Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers? Why y'all trying to trick me? Why you pulling a Loki on me? <laughs> Dale don't wear a hat. <laughs> Well, congratulations, Andre. You will keep the title of our resident Chippendale expert. Uh, I might need to go refresh a little a couple of courses in my chipology. Oh, <laughs> but, uh, you're so humble. But, you're so humble. Be sure to check out Chippendale Park Life, streaming July 28th on Disney+. And here's what's new. Discover more about your favorite Disney Parks attractions in Behind the Attraction. The first five episodes of the original series are now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Risking it all is no stunt. Witness the larger-than-life story of Eddie Braun in Stuntman, streaming tomorrow, July 23rd on Disney+. Plus. The greatest stories are going on a road show. The Disney Plus The Stories Continue Summer Tour 2021 is kicking off this month. Visit Disney.com slash Disney Plus Tour for more details. Marvel Studios' Loki is finally here on Disney Plus, and I got to talk to the director, Kate Heron. Take a look. So hi, Kate. Great to talk to you today. Hey, no, thanks for having me. How did you get to be involved with Loki and, and what drew you into that character? I guess what drew me into the character was, I suppose like everyone, right? Like 
I saw Thor and I, I completely was like fascinated with, you know, the character and Tom's performance. And I'm always kind of drawn, I think, to kind of outsiders. And I, I, I also love villains. Like I think that you don't necessarily have to agree with what they're doing, but you have to understand why they're doing it. And I think Tom brought such empathy from Thor. He's gone on this incredible journey and become, you know, like almost like an anti-hero really, like across those, like those films. And I found obviously they were making a TV show and I love Marvel like I used to I think my first thing I fell in love with with Marvel was the X-Men cartoon and I just have always you know been like oh I'd love to work on a Marvel project and Loki's like my favorite I just basically asked my agent I was like look I know I've only done like a teen uh comedy drama but just just see just see call them up and just see and I, I'd love to speak with them so they met with me and they sent me like Michael's first script which was fantastic and I just kind of went big with it i was just like i'm gonna give them like a full download of everything i'm excited by in the writing and also just where i'm excited where we could take the story and they liked what i brought to them so here i am <laughs> oh that's so great and as a 90s cartoon fan i appreciate the x-men drop that was appreciate that. <laughs> so, but i was actually going to ask you about that about how you bring your voice into the series into the marvel cinematic universe because it has a timeline of its own so how did you have that balance between what's been set and how to bring your voice into it i think for me like even just stylistically it was quite different what i was pitching them because you know there's a mystery running through our show and i was really inspired by like film noir and detective stories and i was like oh it'd be so cool to kind of bring that look to it and how do we make this feel like a new part of marvel because obviously they've done so much already and I think it was a real challenge in doing that, which was very exciting to me. Now you have a background in filmmaking, but also in comedy. And so I would just love to know what brought you to both of those things. What, what, what made you fall in love with filmmaking and with comedy? I, I think for me, comedy in a weird way, I was quite, I've, I, I'm quite shy. And I think it, and my writing partner's a comedian. And I think I just kept, I was like, you know what? I'm just, I wanted to make comedies and I needed to meet comedians. So I just started doing like improv comedy honestly as a way to meet comedians and it really put me outside my comfort zone and then filmmaking i actually came to quite late to be honest i i love movies and I've, i love going to the cinema with my friends and i think in my head i was like oh i'll be an actor but i never really knew what directing was to be honest or like as a job and i had amazing teachers when i was mm, around 17 18 and they just kind of opened my mind up to what cinema can be and they introduced me to you know like just the greats. I think I didn't realize you could have a voice and make a film, which I know sounds silly, but I just hadn't really thought about it in that way. And I love storytelling and I felt like it was kind of a job where I could take all these things I love and put them in one place. Were there uh, any challenges that you faced with putting this series together, whether it was just the pressure of making it or just the actual process of putting it all together? I suppose as a challenge in a sense that you know, we filmed this like a six hour movie. We weren't filming episode by episode. Marvel wanted to run it like a film in the sense that normally with television, obviously you do like the showrunner system and it's very different. And this was like a very big undertaking. So I think for me, the challenge was, you know, like doing a good job and wanting to take care of Loki, the character, because he's very beloved. What did you expect? Would you have any advice for any aspiring filmmakers? I had this thing where when I graduated, I didn't film anything straight away and I think part of it was confidence because I was like oh I have to be like perfect at this job before I can actually do it and I would say just like throw yourselves into the fire and just go make something don't wait for things to be perfect or a giant budget just go make something well this this series everything I've seen so far has looked amazing I appreciate all the work that you've put into it directing it so thank you so much and it was so great to talk to you today this was so wonderful no it was fun cheers <laughs> Oh, that was so cool to talk to Kate Heron. Marvel Studios' Loki is now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Disney Animation's Alice in Wonderland is celebrating its 70th anniversary. We are joined by Tamara Caleb from the Disney Animation Research Library to talk about the film and the contributions of Disney legend, Mary Blair. Welcome to the show. We are so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure being here and it's a pleasure meeting you both. Mary Blair is an iconic Disney concept artist. For those who may not be familiar, can you tell us what a concept artist does? So concept artists are responsible for bringing the idea of the filmmakers and writers to life by visualizing the environments, the characters, 
the props, and sometimes even visual effects and imagining what they could look like. They're the world builders, if you will, who interpret the concept of a film visually so that the filmmakers can begin to build that roadmap for what will ultimately lead to the final look of a film. What should we know about Mary Blair? Mary started in the studios in the 1940s in the story department and worked on a couple of short films that unfortunately never saw the light of day. She also worked on a feature film that you would be familiar with, Dumbo. And in 1941, Walt took notice and wanted her working on several projects. So she found herself contributing to Cinderella and Peter Pan and Melody Time and many others. But it was particularly her work on Alice in Wonderland that bears that trademark touch of her unique style and influence that can be seen and felt from her concept art all the way through to the final film. Here's an image from the March of the Card sequence where you can see the sharply contrasted white, black, and red that punctuates the scene. It's such a great example of Blair's use of strong geometric shapes and patterns that draw the viewer's eye to that single focal point. One of the things that I love about her art is it seems so simplistic, but when you really study it, you can see a craftsmanship and sophistication behind them. Well, the simplicity works for those cards because it's like when you start seeing them in motion, they feel more flat than the other characters, and but it's very also interesting to see how do you make a two-sided card move around so much. And then of course, when they start stacking on top of each other and, and being in a crowd like this, it shows how they feel a little bit different than the other characters in the film. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and Jack! So this is another favorite of mine from Alice in Wonderland. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's getting mad up in here. Blair's use of exaggerated perspective in this piece just accentuates the whimsical nature of the scene. There's something in her art that's so evocative that you just, you feel the intent behind the whimsy, the absurd, and even the humorous elements that Mary wanted to convey. That's one of my favorite Disney scenes. I love the, just all the teacups and everything and just oh. how, how mad that party is. And that, that picture <laughs> definitely demonstrates that that is not going to be a normal tea party. Ah, yes, indeed, the tea. You must have a cup of tea. So Tamara, what do you love about Mary Blair? I think there's a lot that I take away from Mary. One is her work ethic. She was commuting across the country from New York to LA. She was raising a family, taking care of the home in a time when not too many women in the 1940s would be trying to handle all of that. And then also she's just, she's an incredible artist. Her technical abilities, being able to look at a scene or look at a character and to be able to draw that out, it's quite inspiring as both a female and an artist on my own. It was absolutely lovely getting to learn about you and Mary Blair and you truly exude so much joy and you love what you do. So thank you for sharing all of this with us and for being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure meeting you both. You can stream Disney's Alice in Wonderland right now on Disney+. Plus. That's it for us today. Be sure to head on over to Disney Plus to stream all of your favorites and more. We'll see you next time. And a very merry unbirthday to all of you watching. <laughs> Unless it's your birthday, then happy birthday, but not the same. Mm, no, no. We're only celebrating on birthdays here. Yeah, it's written on the cake. Sorry. Why then today is my unbirthday too. It is? What a small world this is!